David Spinks, thank you so much for joining me on the DNA of Purpose podcast. It is such a pleasure having you beam in all the way from New York City today. Welcome. Thank you. Very excited to be here. Although technicality, I am in the suburbs of New York City, so I don't want to mislead anybody thinking, you know, I'm a city guy in the suburbs now. <laughs> You're a suburbs guy. We've got that. I am now, unfortunately, yes. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, look, I want to dive straight on into a question that I ask all the guests on the podcast. Now, as you can imagine, over the years, I've asked a lot of questions. This podcast has now been going for five seasons and I've had the privilege of asking them to some of the most purpose-driven leaders, change makers and consultants on the planet. So what I'm curious to know is what great questions do these people ask of themselves? So with that in hmm. mind, what burning question are you currently pondering that is guiding your work forward? Hmm. Good question. I think I, uh, I've, I'm, I'm finding myself very curious about the concept of social health or what I've been calling social fitness and understanding how can someone improve their social health? The same way we exercise to improve our physical health, we go to therapy or read and learn or get support to help with our mental health. Our social health is extremely important. We're learning that more and more today. More research is coming about, out about how important social health is, but there's very little information or support or services or systems out there to help people actually improve their social health and understand it. And so I find myself really fascinated with that question going down a lot of rabbit holes in that space these days. Mm. How would you define social health? Are you talking specifically about our connection to relationship, our connection to the community? What, what does that constitute? Yeah, that's a great question because there's a lot of nuance there. Mm. Um, and so when we, you know, a question that I've been asked a thousand times in my career is uh, what is a community or how do you define a community? And we talk a lot about belonging. We've talked a lot about loneliness. And these are all really meaty terms that are thrown around kind of haphazardly but uh, there's so much nuance behind them. And so when we talk about social health, which I think people use kind of interchangeably with belonging, right? We say like, mm. do I feel a sense of belonging? Does someone belong? Do they have belonging in their life? What we're really asking is, do they feel socially healthy or socially fit? And so turns out there's many different forms of social health or many different factors that go into social health. We might think it's just having close friends or being close with our family, but there's much more to it than that. Um, there's different forms of loneliness as well. And so, yeah, I mean, for example, there's, um, I've recently learned about uh, research into loneliness and research into social health that that goes back pretty far. So there's a, a paper from 1983 by Daniel Russell and Carolyn Citrins that break down the six provisions for social health. And so, and there's a lot of studies like this that essentially try to capture what it is that we're talking about here and take a research-based approach to it. Um, this study was specifically in the context of stress. So people who are experiencing stress in their life, what kind of social support systems were really helpful for them? And those six provisions that they found were one is attachment. So our emotional attachment uh, to other people. Um, two is social integration. So do you feel like you're with people who have common interests and passions and jobs or hobbies, uh, people who have similarities to you? Um, three is guidance. So people who can provide you actual advice or information or support that can help you in those moments. Four was a reliable alliance. So are they people that you feel like you can count on at points when you need them in the future? 
Um, five was reassurance of worth. So does the group reassure you that you have value, that you are useful to other people? And six was the opportunity for nurturance, which was uh, the sense that others rely on you for their own well-being, that they can count on you to nurture them, mm -hmm. right? So it's so interesting to take this very general idea of belonging or connection and start to understand there's like different ways that we experience that. And the study found that we actually need all six to some degree. We need a balance of all six to truly feel social healthy um, and, mm -hmm. and socially healthy. And so this, this is actually one of the studies that led to the creation of something called the UCLA loneliness score, which is what's being used to track loneliness across the the US across the world it's one of the most common ways of measuring loneliness in societies and so we can kind of gauge how lonely how lonely are people in society using these kinds of factors and getting scores around them um and so yeah it's fascinating i could i could keep going down the rabbit awesome. hole with with more of that kind of stuff the different kinds of loneliness is fascinating how you can be lonely from friends and family you can be lonely yeah. On a, on a universal level, like you can feel lonely, like in the universe, you can feel lonely on a purpose level and not feeling like you have something that you're working toward. Um, you can feel lonely on a more passive level and feel like I'm living in a neighborhood, but no one smiles or says hi to each other, even if it's really small interactions. Mm. Um, so it's a multifaceted topic that, uh, you know, you could spend a long time diving down that rabbit hole. Absolutely. Absolutely. And a beautiful reminder uh, that in the words of Ram Das, I believe that we're all just walking each other home. Hmm. So I, I want to go down this rabbit hole a little bit further and understand a little bit more about the neuroscience of belonging, <laughs> because what you're talking about here, as it turns out, has, has been with us since the beginning of time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's another really exciting rabbit hole you can go down. So <laughs> let's do um, it. Let's do it. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating, especially in the context of how remote we are today to learn about the ways that connection affects our brains and affects our physiology. And so um, there's actually a study that's pretty recent. There, there's still only preliminary results where they they would have they put two people in MRI machines and track their brain waves, and then they had head, each of them had headphones so they could talk to each other, and they were asked to do a pretty typical um, uh, improv exercise of coming up with a story together. Right, so one could say there was a boy walking in the woods, and then the next person would say, and he went down a dark path and the next person say he came up to a house and the next person say, and there was an old woman in it. And the next person say she was seven feet tall, right? So you just build on it and build on it. And they track their brain waves as they got deeper and deeper into creating this story together. And as they started, as, as the story got deeper, they found that their brain waves actually started to synchronize. And then they asked people afterward, you know, to what level they felt connected, what, you know, were they enjoying the experience and the people who felt more connected and felt more joy had a greater synchronization in their brain waves, right? So our brain waves actually synchronize when we feel deeply connected to people. And we know that our, our uh, hormones will start to also align when we're feeling really connected to people. There was a study that tracked a, a rowing crew and, and as they got into the routine of rowing and working together, their mm -hmm. hormones started to align, right? So the way our minds and our bodies release cortisol and dopamine, it all starts to align. And so we have these very physical reactions to connecting with other people. And things as simple as eye contact can release dopamine in your body and release chemicals in your body. So it's one thing that we don't get on Zoom calls, right? You can't actually mm. make eye contact. We're only using two of our senses, right? We can't smell the room. We're not seeing the same things around us. The lighting is different around us. There's so many things that we're not capturing when we're only in remote settings. And so, um, you know, it makes sense. This is how we were wired. This is how we evolved. The reason that humans evolved beyond other human species is literally because of our ability to form larger groups, our ability to believe in something is actually what led us to something that's beyond the physical realm, right? Like mm. a purpose, <laughs> getting right into it. 
having a shared purpose is what allowed us to form much larger groups than the other human species that could only form groups with, you know, the, the physical people around them, um, the, the, the physical needs that they had to you know, eat and protect. That's all they could do. But Homo sapiens could believe that that rock has purpose, that the sky has purpose, that there's a God, that there's some other larger reason. And that allowed us to exceed, you know, what we call Dunbar's number, 150 people. It allowed us to grow these large groups. And that's, you know, we weren't smarter, we weren't bigger, we weren't stronger than and than some of the other human species, but we out survived them because of our groups. So it's literally wired into how we evolved. And so it makes perfect sense that when we truly feel connected to each other, there's some very physical responses that we have. And we have this equilibrium state that we are constantly trying to reach for our social health, that if we are not reaching the level of social connection that we expect, we start to develop a craving, right? And it's mm -hmm. actually, I was just, um, I just learned this on uh, Andrew Huberman's podcast, that it's the same exact part of your brain that gets triggered when you crave food, when you're hungry, um, or even water, um, that triggers when you feel lonely and you start to have a craving for social connection. The same exact neurons in your brain mm. are responding to that and the same dopamine releases in your body react to that to the extent that they ran studies and they would have people uh, be socially isolated and then show them a whole number of images of different objects and people and food. And they found when they showed them pictures of food, they, it actually tri triggered their craving just because they were socially isolated, even though they weren't necessarily hungry. And the same happened when they had them fast and not eat, they had higher uh, need for social interaction because it's the same part of the brain that's being triggered. So, you know, I've heard people say that social connection is like, you know, food and water in terms of our hierarchy of needs as humans. And I've always kind of like rolled my eyes at that a little bit, but it turns out there's actually a lot of truth to it. And now we know that a lack of social connection hurts our health in a very serious mm. way. Um, and it literally kills us. So maybe it's not that much of a stretch. Yeah, look, I love that. And and what you've just shared uh, speaks to me in relation to, I guess, my understanding of purpose, because I find it really interesting that so often when we talk about purpose, we talk about it being my why, you know, it's, it's this kind of individual solo pursuit for meaning where I actually don't think we can experience purpose without this sense of belonging and the neuroscience you have just shared the fact that we are hardwired for social health actually speaks to this idea because we need that social context in order to be able to create meaning and essentially have the experience of, of feeling a purpose um so yeah I love I love what you've just shared however I want to dive back into your story in a little more detail. Mm. I have just spent, uh, you know, much of the last or yesterday, the last 24 hours delving into the <laughs> business of belonging, how to make mm -hmm. community your competitive advantage. And I know today will be already has been actually a conversation that will add so much to my community. However, before going there, uh, I'd love to learn a little bit more about your life growing up. I know you grew up in an immigrant family. Your dad was Irish mm -hmm. and your mum from Israel. Uh, mm -hmm. They moved to the USA where you were born. In the book, you mentioned feeling new and different growing up and perhaps mm -hmm. a little bit out of place. How did uh, this foundational experience and your experiences, more broadly speaking, growing up, shape your quest to unlock belonging and in turn guide you towards discovering your life purpose? Hmm. Yeah, I think it's how it goes, right? You know, it's the thing that you struggle with most becomes uh, a strength later and it's almost like a a puzzle that was presented to me at a very early age. And, and the more I tried to solve that puzzle, the more I learned how complex it is. And even as I figured out how to find connection for myself after struggling with it as a child, you know, it just sent me down this path of trying to understand connection, understand community. And already we've covered, you know, how nuanced this topic is. So it's, it's a puzzle that um, has infinite solutions. And 
I mean, what fun is that to, uh, to be able to spend your life trying to solve it? And so I think it just triggered this curiosity for me and, and, how people connect. Um, yeah, my parents were immigrants. I was born a year after they moved to the US. And, you know, you don't realize that when you're a kid, you, you know, you only know your parents from the point you were born. Um, and you only know the reality you were born into. But now in hindsight, understanding the world more, having a lot more experience, you know, it must have been really unique for me to grow up in that setting where my parents didn't know anyone when they came to the US. We had one family like uh my my uncle aunt and four cousins um lived in in our town outside of that we didn't know anybody we didn't have an established network we didn't have roots and so my parents were building their community and growing their roots the same time i was born and so where other kids typically grow up in a place where there's some connection um some established network um we didn't have that and it's interesting to think back about how an, how a kid must experience that and how I experienced that. Um, culturally, our home was different as well, right? They came from Israel and my dad was born in Ireland, lived in England for much of his life. So that's not too different from the US. Israel was, was a bit more different. Um, but um, it led me to struggle with finding belonging and connection, but I was someone who always craved it. I was an extrovert. Um, which interestingly, I've I've learned more about extroversion recently and how um, it doesn't mean I value connection any more than an introvert. It just means I actually need a lot more connection to reach that, that balanced level of social health, to feel whole. And so I needed a lot more social interaction and I craved it more, but I couldn't get it. I know I was mm. excluded um, I would have falling, I would have friends and then have falling outs. I would, um, you know, set out on my bike some days, just looking for someone to hang out with, like hoping I'd run into people that would let me hang out with them. So it was a little, I had a lot of lonely, lonely experiences at a young age that, um, drove me to, yeah, be curious about it and just pay really close attention to how people connected and, I would look at people who are popular, who seem to have a really innate ability to connect with other people. And I remember just paying very close attention to <laughs> the details, like where their eyes were looking and the way they smiled and the timing of their jokes and how they held their bodies. And um, I just wanted to know, you know, I wanted to know, like, how do you connect with people? How do you become likable? And so, you know, by the time I got to college, I became pretty good at it and I became very social and the person who I like to connect with all the groups, you know, I didn't want just one group. I like to be a bridge between the entire ecosystem and be a connector. And that's ultimately what became my career. I've been doing community for my whole career. And then I built the community for community managers to yep. help other people do this work professionally. And, you know, I even did a sabbatical for about a year recently. And, uh, you know, I went on sabbatical thinking, I think I'm going to try something else now, you know, maybe I'll be a musician or an artist <laughs> or a farmer or, you know, try a different line of work. Maybe I'll learn how to code. And I came back and I was just still very curious about community and I'm still asking a lot of the same questions, but uh, I really enjoy it. I love that. I love that passion. And I can see it in you, in, in, in the way you're talking about your subject today. And, um, you know, it's, it's a testament to what it takes to master a subject, because this is obviously something that has been inside of you since, since those early days. And what an incredible journey you've had just to frame up some of what you just shared. By the age of 14, you built your first community around your favorite video game, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 4. And then mm -hmm. by college, you started a successful community focused blog. You went on to co-found CMX by 2014, establishing an annual conference and a thriving community of over 20,000 professionals, uh, during which time you attracted speakers from companies such as Lyft, Airbnb, 500 startups and Apple. In fact, CMX was so successful that in 2019, Bevy, known for their chapter based community platforms, acquired CMX. Now, this undeniably sounds like a wild ride, but apart from your <laughs> obvious community building know-how, what were the key trends that converged over that period of time that today 
have ushered us into an era where community building is arguably the most vital skill for any leader, entrepreneur or change maker. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think community has always been a vital skill. I think just the flavor and the context have changed. Um, I think businesses have started taking it a lot more seriously as something to invest in. Uh, for a few trends, you know, I think if you go back to even 10 years ago, um, there was the big customer service trend led by companies like Zappos, where it was all about making your your customers as happy as possible and delivering happiness. And there was a shift, right? Before that, customer service was seen as just something you kind of had to do. And if you ever had to get on the phone with customer service with any company, you knew it was going to be a complete nightmare. And that started to shift to, okay, how do we support our customers? How do we make them happy? Then it shifted into uh, being even more proactive in having customer success. How do you educate your customers? How do you set them up to be able to better use your tools or be successful in their career and in their lives? Um, of course, this all came up during the social media revolution. So people started becoming more connected than ever before. And, and so basically what we've seen is this trend of people being more empowered or customers being more empowered because we're able to talk to each other in greater and greater ways. Back in the day, and you know, you could go back all the way to the Industrial Revolution, people didn't have a way to really talk to each other at scale. If you had a bad experience with a product, you could tell you know the 10 people that you know, and the, it would kind of end there. Um, but with social media, that just got accelerated and accelerated and accelerated to the point where if you treated customers really poorly, that reputation would spread very, very quickly and you would you would go out of business. And so out of necessity, they had to start really caring about customers and listening to customers and putting the focus on how to empower them. And that led all the way to, you know, community is kind of the ultimate manifestation of that where, um, you're not just supporting them. You're not just trying to make them successful, but you're actually trying to create a space where they can find that sense of connection. They can find a sense of belonging. They feel like they're a part of something. They even help you build the thing, right? And we got collaborative yeah. consumption. We got the Airbnbs, the Lyfts, the Ubers of the world. We got um, really large online platforms like you know Wikipedia. And, um, sh you know, Shopify now and GitHub, you know, these ecosystems where it's actually the community building the product itself. Um, and so I think, like I said, community has always been a core part of how we create value for each other. Actually, if you look at the word company, it, it, the roots, the etymology of it comes from come together and penis over bread. It was how we came to traders would come together mm. and um, exchange goods over dinner, over meals. Um, it's always been a core part of how we do business. It's just how we've come together and the extent and the scale, right? The scale that companies can build communities now really quickly and efficiently using a lot of the new technology that's come out to help you build online communities. It's just made it uh, um, a big opportunity and, and something that a lot of, I think, customers and consumers are craving and looking for. Mm. So as I mentioned before the podcast, some, some of the focus of this season is really around how leaders can mobilize a community for a purpose. So I'm keen to explore with you, how might a leader pinpoint that one idea with the potential to amplify the kind of influence required to ignite a community? And from there, what are the fundamental elements that make a community sticky enough to build momentum? Hmm. It's not, so in the world of business, I actually think sometimes we lean a little too heavily on purpose in, in the world of community. Mm -hmm. Um, for business, I think sometimes a business will say like, we have this really big vision, like we're going to transform education or we're going to, you know, rethink how innovation happens. Right. And then it's so like, they'll start a community and say, this community is for people who want to rethink innovation or, or transform the education, the world of education. And, and then they launch a space and people are just like, cool, we're here. What do we do? What are we talking about? <laughs> now what? <laughs> And it's just so lofty. It's so big. Like that can work for 
you know, social justice communities or political movements um, where you're really trying to create change. And so there's this big lofty purpose or vision. And what do people do? Well, they they vote. They try to get other people to vote. They try to change policy. That's the action they can take. But when you're trying to, you know, change education or something like that, um, it's really hard to get people in a room to say, let's change education. Then they're like, Great. What do we do here? How how do we take action on this? It's it's too lofty. It's too big. And so, um, what I what I recommend businesses do is to figure out. I like to call it their turpentine from Picasso's favorite quote. If it actually came from him, who knows if quotes actually came from people <laughs> in the past anymore? But it's a great quote nonetheless. Where um, he said that uh, when art critics get together, all they talk about is uh, theory and vision and purpose of the art. Uh, but when artists get together, they talk about where to buy cheap turpentine, All right? So you have to figure out who are the artists in your community? Who are the people who are actually trying to do the work? They have a goal they're trying to accomplish. They have a problem they're trying to solve. There's a point they're trying to get to. What's that job they're trying to do? And then figure out what are the questions that are coming up on a day-to-day -day basis for them? What are, what's their turpentine? What's the thing that they're actually struggling with that they actually want to talk to each other about and start conversations around that? The purpose is in the background. The purpose is a reminder of why they're there. It's it's a sense of we are part of this larger thing that brings us together, which is really important. But the day-to-day -day isn't about talking just about the purpose. It's about talking about the things that they actually care about in their day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. And that really speaks to the idea that, that purpose itself is a verb. Like you can't just retrofit a purpose. People need to own it and they own it through the turpentine essentially that is the exactly. action taking that's that's the part of it that matters and from what you're sharing that's how people create that stickiness i just referred to is is yeah. through that shared action taking exactly and like yeah. purpose doesn't have to be this big lofty thing i think it's another mm. thing businesses do is they have this real fluffy big we're changing the world thing when mm. you know it's like a community i just spoke to it's a community for people who have tiny houses and like, if you asked about the purpose, it wouldn't be like, we're trying to change the world through tiny houses. It's just like, we are all real. We just really love tiny houses. There's just something about them <laughs> that just, just gets thing. us going. <laughs> it's just so cool. Like, look how yeah. tiny this house is. And I get it. I've stayed in tiny houses with my wife. It's so much fun. They're delightful. They're just, you're just like in the middle of nature in this tiny little home that's somehow really efficient. And, you know, I think sometimes it's just, uh, a genuine curiosity for a topic, uh, something that people love and they just, it, it's something they're doing in their life that they want to have camaraderie around and have other mm -hmm. people to share that passion with and talk to about that thing. Um, you don't have to change the world with every community. The purpose can be really simple, really minimal. Sometimes it could even seem shallow, right? Like people will hate on a community that's just all memes, but we need those kinds of communities as well. Mm. We need a diversity of connection. There's actually some research I read that says that going back to social health, we we need a portfolio of interactions is what they, we, they called it. So more so than just having a good friend that you talk to all the time, being able to say hi to your neighbor, having a place where you could just like an improv class where you could just be silly and have fun, going to your favorite internet forum where people are just making jokes the whole time. And then also being able to go to your therapy group and going really deep. We need different levels of community, different kinds of community. So don't get so caught up on your purpose needing mm. to be this really deep, really meaningful, really totally. lofty thing. Just and to find your the point, thing that people connection, care about. connection is actually the purpose. It's about the connectivity before anything else yes but i would i want to clarify that because it's yep. another layer sticking it up. point for yep. me yeah um up. a lot of the time businesses will pitch community as as the reason that you should come join their group right like come come join our group you'll find your peers you you'll find belonging you'll find connection mm. what i found is that people primarily join community for benefits and then they stick around for belonging and connection. Mm -hmm. And so there's always belonging or hope that you might find connection or belonging. It's always in the back of our minds. For some, that might be a small aspect to why they're joining the group, right? Like maybe they're joining a group for accountants because they just like really have a lot of questions about how to use Excel and they want to ask those questions and get answers. A very clear, practical benefit. But once they're in there and they start interacting with the same people over and over again and they start helping other people and they feel that emotional connection, that's where they start to really value 
belonging. And even if you're someone who's actively seeking out belonging, like you're looking for new friends, you move to a new city, you're, you're looking for people to connect with, you still are going to look for things that have a benefit you're interested in. You're not mm -hmm. going to go to the pottery class if you don't care about pottery. You're not going to join a run club if you hate running, right? It still needs to provide a benefit first, and then belonging is what will keep you coming back and make it such an enriching experience for you. Mm. And so this is a great segue into my next question. In the book, you referenced the spaces model, which essentially mm -hmm. outlines the measurable components of community success. Those mm -hmm. included support, product, acquisition, contribution, engagement, and success. Are you able Correct. to give our listeners an overview of the spaces model and share a few insights in, I guess, the most common mistakes that leaders and organizations can make along the way? Yeah, totally. So again, community, big, broad, beefy term, right? Yeah. Um, it means a lot of things. Uh, really, on a fundamental level, from a from a business standpoint, it's the shift from we are going to do things for people and create things for people to we are going to help people create value for each other, right? I like to compare it to marketing. Marketing is how you um, how you distribute value to other people, right? It's like a broadcast, one to many. Community is how you connect them with each other so they create value for each other. It's many to many, and so. That's something that you can apply to pretty much any part of business, right? Any part of business, whether it's you're creating your product, you're marketing, you're creating content, you you have an approach where you just create all the value for people, or you could take an approach where they can create value for each other. There's a social solution to this problem. And so the spaces model was meant to help businesses understand the different areas that community can drive value for for the business to help it achieve different goals. Because before that, businesses would always say, hey, we're just building community. Um, and it would just kind of be loosely attached to lots of different goals. So we wanted to articulate it. So my team and I worked on creating the spaces model. And so to go through it, yeah. So the first one, support. And so traditional support is one to many, right? Like um, they, someone has a question and they come to us and we give them the answer. They call us, they send us an email, something like that. The many-to-many -many approach is to create a space where people can answer questions for each other. So we see companies will launch a support forum, for example. Product. Um, we may talk to people directly and collect their product feedback. A uh, social solution to that is to host focus groups or create an online space where we can share new features that we're releasing and gather feedback from each other, have them try it, have them comment on each other's feedback. So we're creating a social solution to us learning how to improve our product. A is for acquisition. So we market ourselves, we create content, we run ads, we host events for people to learn about our product, to you know, enter our pipeline, ultimately become customers. Taking a community approach to it is empowering your community members to self-organize local events, um, allowing your members to create content for each other, allowing your members to become ambassadors and advocates for you. So you're creating a social solution to how you grow your business. Um, contribution, C, is uh, any platform where members are creating the content that makes your product. So you could think of like an Airbnb or a Lyft or an Uber, uh, Wikipedia. These are examples where the content itself is contributed by the members. And so again, you, you know, Lyft or Uber could have just offered uh, taxi services themselves, but they created a social solution. They empowered contributors. So anytime you want to build something and you want to um, empower a group of people to build it instead of you doing it yourself, you could take a community approach. E is for engagement. And so instead of us constantly emailing our members and constantly trying to like create content and um, keep our customers engaged ourselves, can we create an ecosystem, a community where they're now they're coming to us anytime, again, if it's an accounting community, when they have an accounting question, instead of going to Google or somewhere else, they can come to this community and it becomes a resource that they come back to time and time again. They become more engaged. They're more likely to stick around as a customer over time. And then success, similarly, success is about how do you provide customer success? So we can create courses for each for our customers and teach them how to use our product or how to be successful in their career. 
or we could take a social solution and have our members teach each other, create guides for each other, um, uh, uh, Act, uh, mentor each other, proactively teach each other how to better use our product. Like uh, the Salesforce Trailblazer community mm -hmm. is a really good example of that, right? So all of them is just, all of these are just ways for a business to understand how do we take a problem that maybe previously we would just try to solve directly and see if there's an opportunity to create a social solution that brings in that connection, that camaraderie, all the additional benefits that uh, a community can provide that our, us as a team or our content can't quite provide because we can't provide that same level of peer support, breadth of feedback, personalization. There's things that communities can do that we just could never do. Mm. Um, and you asked about a common mistake. Yeah, I think pitfalls. one of the biggest, yeah, I think the biggest mistake is just trying to do too many of those things at once. They'll launch a community and say, great, we're going to like get product feedback. We're going to grow. We're going to retain our customers. We're going to have people contribute to a product we're building. Each of those is an entire department in a company. Each of them will have different tools that you might want to use to build the community. There are different kinds of community programs, right? So like a support forum is going to look very different than a focus group, which is going to look very different than uh, local events that you're hosting. So um, they're all different kinds of programs that can solve those problems, different tools, different metrics that are attached to it. And so what I'd recommend doing if you're working with a community team or if you have people working on community in your company is just make sure that they have clarity on which one of those goals is most important to the company and which ones are community best suited to solve in the most effective way and focus on those goals. You'll still impact the other stuff, right? Even if you have a event or support form, you'll still get product feedback in it. It will happen, but you don't want to make all six things a priority for your community team because they're going to be spread very, very thin and it's setting them up for failure. Figure out the one thing that they can really deliver with community, get that right, and then add another goal and then add another goal. Mm. I just want to loop back to our previous question for a moment where mm -hmm. we were talking about stickiness in community. And you mentioned uh, the attractorship essentially like it's one thing to have stickiness but you've got to get people into the group in the first mm -hmm. place so how do you do that how do you get people into a community in, in, yeah in in the first place yeah i mean most communities i recommend start really small and really hands-on yeah. right you're trying to build i imagine it like a center of gravity right like once you have social density in the middle people want to be a part of that it's like you know, it's, it's, it's not fully like high school, but not, not like high school where like, there's a, a group that like, if people are look, look like they are really enjoying each other's time and they're, they are, mm. um, you know, they like being together. There's a high social energy there. Then, uh, you feel drawn to that. You want to be a part of that. You want to tap into that. And so you can do that by starting small and focusing on that social density, really making it clear who this community is for and who the community is not for, right? Exclude with empathy because saying this is this is who this community is not for is what's going to make the members who are included feel like, oh, this is really for me and people like me. Being very hands-on, right? I would do one-on-one -on -one conversations. I would tap into the trust I already have with people or really focus on building trust with those people, really understanding what their needs are, what their problems are, what their turpentine is, and then designing intimate small community experience that's highly like very hands-on and highly personalized to them right like who mm. wouldn't want that community right mm. if someone came to you and said i just spoke to you and 10 people like you i spent hours learning about your needs um and i'm, I'm gonna spend a whole lot of time just trying to solve those problems and all these people meet this certain bar that we've set for who they are what their needs are, their experience, where they are in their careers or their hobbies or their life, whatever it is, we're bringing them together around. And I'd love for you to be a part of that group. Would you be interested in joining? Who wouldn't want to say yes to that, right? So it's, it's making it a, something that they almost can't say no to. And then you just get them in the room and you learn and you innovate and you adapt. You try you know, a small discussion group and oh, that, that one didn't work. Okay. Maybe it was a topic. Let's try a different topic. Oh, that didn't work either. Okay. Maybe small discussion groups aren't right. Let's, let's um, try uh, just asynchronous conversations for a while. Let's try a big group. Let's try a very a really facilitated experience. Let's try 
um, setting a goal that we're all trying to hit and working towards that goal. And so you just experiment and iterate the same way you build a product, you build a community, you just try things that you you form a hypothesis on what you think is going to work, try it. If it works great, now you can build on it. You can invite more people, invite more mm. people. And once you have that center of gravity and it's working and you really have community member fit, then then you can start to turn the you know typical marketing engine on of how do we distribute our community through our website, through our emails, through our social media, through other conversations. Can we invite, um, can we ask our members to invite other members and give them referrals, um, you know, uh, promote it at our events. You, you think about any way that you would promote a, a product, you can promote a community as well. Mm. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I imagine one of the I would things, never. <laughs> I imagine <laughs> that one of the things that might be really scary for you know say a, fir a first time community builder in terms of looking at the risks is this idea that everybody within that community has a voice and as we know human beings and human communication can be fairly unpredictable so what mm. guidance would you offer these people for navigating the unpredictable element of human communication managing boundaries in the group and, and managing the flow of the conversation, particularly if, particularly if you're someone who might want to control the brand messaging. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're, if, if you're building a community, you're giving up control. Yeah. Um, that's a <laughs> which core is, premise. Which, of is, which is scary for all of us. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's um, you're giving up control. I mean, one of the biggest fears that I hear from companies launching communities is uh, what if people say something negative about us and uh, to which I reply, they're already saying negative things about you, just not in rooms where you are also present. Mm. So would you rather have those conversations happen in a space where you are there and you can partake in that conversation and you can say, thank you for sharing that. We really appreciate your feedback. I'm taking this back to the team right now. We're going to talk about this. And then you can come back a week later and say, hey, I spoke about this with the team. Here are the actions we're going to take to improve this. Thanks again for your feedback. How much better is that than them sharing that feedback in a quiet, dark corner of the internet where you have no idea what they're saying? Um, when you're empowering them to host events, they're going to be creating, you have to give them guide rails. So you can set boundaries like, mm -hmm. Here are the brand, here's the branding guidelines for what you have to do. Here are our values. We'd like for you to share those values with everybody at the start of each event. Um, all of our events must be free. Here's our policy on how to work with sponsors. You can set all those guidelines, but within those guidelines, within those guide rails is what I call them, um, those members have creative freedom. They can choose their own speakers. They can design it in their own way. They can be creative with the way they set up conversations. Um, so it's about setting guide rails and then within those guide rails, letting people have control, have autonomy, um, feel like they have power, right? Because if you, if they don't feel like they have power, then they're not going to be co-creating this thing with you. Then it's not a community. Mm. Do you have any strategies while we're looking at how, I guess, essentially how we influence a community? Do you have any mm -hmm. strategies or I guess case studies or examples where you've really had to inspire a community to change behavior or to adapt into a different direction or pivot in some way? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a con communities are in a constant state of evolution, right? Like mm. you're always going to be changing. You're always going to be evolving. You might change a platform. You might go from free to paid. You might go from small to big. O almost always that is a change you will experience, right? Mm. Going from small to big. Um, you know, my community was acquired, right? And we navigated that transition. So um, you actually have to transition. You have to change because if you stagnate, uh, your community will no longer be relevant as your members' needs change, as the world changes, as uh, other communities form that solve for different needs. So you have to innovate. You always have to evolve. Um, you know, I think uh, there's a couple of tools that I use. Uh, there's a really great tool called the Community Commitment Curve, um, was, which actually started in the change management world. Mm. And the idea is that you're not going to get people to change by asking them to make huge sweeping changes all at once. What you want to do is um, make small asks while their level of commitment to that change are low, 
um, just, you know, read this information, uh, just consume, just learn, just small ask. You're not, you're not having to do too much. And then as their level of commitment goes up, then you ask them to make bigger and bigger, uh, take bigger, bigger actions. You make bigger asks of them to, mm. all right, now like join this group or let's try this new process or let's launch this new program. Um, so I think, um, if you're trying to like really change a culture or a process or something big like that, um, taking that slower methodical approach can be very effective. Um, if it's a big, more abrupt change, um, then, you know, like, like an acquisition, um, then, you know, it's, it's a lot about communication and making sure that members feel heard and they have a space to express their concerns. Um, I actually am doing a, a really big report, a big guide on how to sell a community right now, which is really fascinating and looking at how these communities were acquired and how they navigated it with their community. And some of the best things that these community leaders did was just make themselves extremely accessible after making that announcement about that mm -hmm. change. They would host Q and A's in the forum. They would host events. Um, a lot of them reached out directly to their core members, like the most active members in the community and got on the phone one-on-one -on -one with them just to say, hey, this change is happening. I know these are probably some concerns that you'll have. So I wanted to talk through them with you and give you a chance to ask me anything you want. So people really just want to feel heard. They want to feel like they are part of that change, part of making that decision, or if not part of the decision, part of um, like their their concerns are being heard and, and being navigated as you go through that transition. Um, so just being really proactive at that kind of uh, communication and making people feel like they're heard. Mm. And and to give context to that question, the reality is, uh, is that we live in a world of relentless change. And so in some ways, these skills are vital uh, for not only starting a com community, but allowing that community to evolve in the context of the current climate. And so I want to talk about some of those trends. Now, I mentioned uh, in my email setting up today's conversation that there have been a few fut future of work themes that I've been exploring as they emerge. And one of those themes revolves around remote working. Some leaders mm -hmm. love it while others detest it, but it seems that to some extent it's probably here to stay. Now, mm -hmm. I personally believe that remote working essentially offers organizations an opportunity to transcend the conventional boundaries of four walls and a business by delving more deeply into a community mindset, especially since a community inherently extends beyond these barriers. So I'm curious to know what's your take on the intersection of hybrid working and the potency of community building as a strategy to redefine the business as usual framework hmm. the reality is i don't think we can form as strong connections when we're working remotely as when okay. we do in person um you know we we discussed earlier the the very physical differences with talking on zoom versus talking in person with somebody mm -hmm. and the impact that has on your brain and your body um uh, i've done a lot of research into serendipity which is a really fun topic. And um, for serendipity to occur, you need lots of triggers, right? Lots of crossing paths with people and information. That kind of serendipity happens in an office a lot because you're physically crossing paths. You can see a lot more around you. You see a lot of different people. You interact with people outside of your usual team. When you're remote, uh, it's much harder for serendipity to occur. You don't cross paths as much. You don't intersect with people outside of your regular meetings and your team. Um, and so, you know, I think it, it's definitely brought us the ability to have more balance in our lives uh, and more freedom and autonomy, which is a great thing. Um, but from the perspective of how strong a sense of community is amongst our team with each other, um, there, uh, there are limitations there. Um, mm. There are opportunities there as well. Um, you know, if someone felt uncomfortable in an office, then allowing them to be working remotely from home may allow them to interact with people in a way that's healthier for them. Um, uh, for people with disabilities, uh, it, it adds a lot more access and allows them to participate in these communities. Um, I think that 
going back to what we said earlier about having a diversity of connection and a you know portfolio of interactions i think for companies they start what they've been asking is like well how do we build stronger community through remote channels mm -hmm. um and you should a absolutely ask that you should be thinking about how do we keep our mem our employees connected and um efficient at collaborating and feeling like they're a part of something and I do think things like retreats and getting people together in person is really critical for that, even if it's only a few times a year. But what I, I'd like to see companies think about and start to prioritize is say, okay, well, they're no longer coming together in person. And so uh, a level of connection and social health that they were deriving from work, they're no longer getting. How can we support our employees in being able to improve their social health by finding connection in other parts of their life? Can we support them in being more connected with their family and making mm. sure they have time to spend with their family? Can we give them budgets and, and guidance on joining other social groups or, or letting them find social connection in other spaces in their life? Because I, I think if you only look at it in the one track of how do we get people to be as engaged in community as possible, in, in our company, then you're going to end up with unhealthy employees from a social perspective, employees who feel uh, anxious, who feel depressed, who feel unhealthy, who are low energy, uh, who are tired because they are not getting the social connection, the social health that they need. That's not a productive, effective employee. I think a lot of employees are getting burned out we we're talk we're saying it's because it's Zoom. We're saying because it's remote work. Mm. I think the underlying layer that people are missing is it's their social health. They're feeling isolated. They're feeling alone. So they're burning out and they're quiet quitting or loudly quitting. And so it makes sense. I think it's a it's a smart investment for companies to invest in the holistic social health of their employees, which might actually mean deprioritizing connection in the company so that you can prioritize giving them a more balanced sense of community and yeah. social health in their entire life. Yeah, I love that answer because there's so much to explore in relation to what it means to be a company. If you start to extend that definition to other places where people can connect beyond that, beyond those four walls, as long as that, as you've just said, that social connectivity is still at the forefront uh, in the conversation so that people are actually still able to be physically present and experiencing uh, all of the emotions and all of the responses that we spoke about at the beginning of the conversation. So there's a lot to explore there. Yeah. What? I just, I, real, real quick, it's just like, yeah. I think it's actually, a, like, it's like a good shift too, because before yeah. remote work, you know, there's this trend to your, your, your work is everything, right? This like yeah. Googleization of the office where you come here for your, your friendship. Uh, we're going to do a happy hour. Uh, you can get, our doctors are here. You can get a massage here. You, you know, we're going to do a sports team and it's just like, let's make our company as much of our employees lives as possible. And what that did was really reduce the the balance of our social diet to you know it's like we're just eating carbs and we're not getting their vegetables and we're not getting our fruit and we're not getting anything yeah. else in our diet we're just getting this one form of social connection through work and that's not good right like that was also oh, really really that. bad balance your social diet exactly Need different so it's, foods. I think yeah it's important for businesses and work to understand where they fit in that balanced diet and realize mm. that they're providing, they're very important, but they're not the entire diet. They're providing one piece of it and it would benefit them to make sure that their employees have a healthy diet, almost to the extent that like, get out of here, get out of the office, stop talking about work, stop thinking about work for the next you know, five, six hours at your home with your family, with your friends and your hobbies. Like, how do we get you to disconnect from work so that when you're here, you are fully connected? Mm. Yeah, it reminds me very much uh, of a conversation that I had uh, with Courage Expert. I've just released that episode. And he was talking about brand citizenship. So looking mm. uh, at a company 
as a country. And he was talking about it through a branding perspective. But what I liked about that idea is it, again, it extended the company beyond those four walls. So you might have a brand that's connected to a gym, that's connected to a cafe and that you join, you know, you're, you almost become a citizen of that brand through all of those different links. And I love it in relation to uh, how we might go about balancing our social diet in that context. Hmm. David, I'm, I'm coming to the last, you know, last two questions in the podcast, but I'm really curious to understand how AI is impacting the community space because all of a sudden hmm. we have a tool that has access to be able to analyse data uh, at speed mm -hmm. and potentially match people up and form communities in an entirely mm -hmm. new way. What do you know about this space? Yeah, it's it's a pretty fascinating time. So like everything else, there's pros and cons. Yeah. Um, you know, some of the cons are that people are starting to rely on AI for relationships that they might have otherwise relied on other humans for. And they're relying on AI to solve problems that other humans would have solved for us. So it's a another loss of uh, opportunity to connect the same way mm -hmm. we, you know, humans used to connect around providing food for each other. And now we're so many layers removed away from our food source that we, we lost that connection. Um, our protection isn't from our neighbor, it's from a police department, right? And so now like a lot of basic information you know, was replaced by Google for a while. And now AI is taking that to another level where instead of asking a friend or your mom or a colleague for uh, help with a question, you might ask AI. Um, people are turning to it for romantic relationships as well. It's a, mm. a China, there's a study in China, there's an, an app there that is growing rapidly that's providing people with uh, a romantic companionship. And so, you know, it's hard to have romantic companionship with people. Can we just use bots? Are there downsides to that? I think we <laughs> might find that yes, there are. Um, and so we're seeing that con. We're also seeing a lot of AI generated content in communities, which is not good because the quality of that content is very mm. low. Someone asks a question and all their answers are just generated by chat GPT, which is kind of obvious and just kind of sad. Um, I don't know if you've seen this or experienced this, but I'm even experiencing it on you know, social media, if I point on a post on LinkedIn, it's like so obvious that some people just use chat GPT to come up with a response or a comment mm. and they're just churning that out. So um, the overall quality of conversation is being impacted by that. Um, that said, uh, you, you gave a couple good examples there where AI, I think, can really enable community builders to do their work at scale at a much more effective level. Um, our limitation as humans is <laughs> how much information we can hold in our brain at once. So if you have a community of hundreds or even thousands of people, you know, someone might come to me and ask me, hey, who do you know who works in the healthcare space and is building a community that's using this specific piece of software uh, who lives in Michigan? <laughs> and there's no way I can provide that answer in my brain. Mm -hmm. um, I try to, but it's very hard. Uh, AI can help you do that, right? It can actually pull all that information and say, oh, actually, here's somebody that fits all those things that could be a great person for you to connect with. And as a community professional, I can automate those connections and and be able to connect members of my community with people who are highly relevant to them at scale. Going back to serendipity, you can engineer serendipity in a more effective way when you have access to more data. Um, I think it's also helping us be more creative as community builders, you know, if um you know, you have to come up with content every single day. It can help you generate ideas for content. Again, mm -hmm. I don't recommend just pasting content from ChatGPT in there, but you might say like, give yeah, me a hundred ideas for questions that people in this kind of community might have. And it gives you an idea and helps you understand um, what kind of content might resonate with them. Um, mm. Yeah, so I think it's, 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 it's a tool designed to help us, not replace us. It is, yeah, mm. but it mm. replaces parts of us, right? That's what yeah. we were talking about earlier. It replaces some part of us. So we have to be really aware of which parts it's replacing and, and how we're going to fill those holes. Mm -hmm. So I've come to my last question for the day. What I'm wondering is if you had access to the biggest billboard in the world, where you could write a single word or phrase that encapsulates your most profound realization or contribution to the world, 
what would you say and why? Hmm. Yes, it's Tim Ferriss question. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that, but I'll take that. <laughs> so. yeah, I think, yeah. yeah, I think that's his, he does that in his podcast as well. It's a great question. I probably should have had an answer for it, given the fact that I've heard it <laughs> in the past. Hmm. I'll say what, what's coming to mind right now. It's something that I've been trying to remind myself of which is life is a dance. Mm. Um, I share that because I am a perfectionist. I, uh, I am very goal oriented. I'm in a season of transition in my career. As I said, I did sabbatical. I stepped down from my company. I'm doing a lot of writing and researching and exploring right now. So there's a lot of uncertainty and that brings me a lot of anxiety sometimes not knowing, you know, what peak of the mountain I'm, climbing up toward what what's the goal out there i'm running toward um but i always i, I when i remind myself I, I forget who i heard say this but life is a dance instead of thinking of it as a race to a finish line or some mountain that you're trying to climb looking at it at it as a dance it just helps me feel present and it doesn't matter which way i go i get very afraid of taking the wrong path mm -hmm. making a mistake that you know, oh no, now I'm closing off all these other paths or this was the wrong path. I should have gone a different way. When you look at it as a dance, there is no right or wrong path. You're literally just flowing and moving and, you know, moving in every direction. And um, I think that's, that's a good way of looking at life. Mm, yeah, it's absolutely beautiful. And, and for me, the right message at the right time, because I am also in a little bit of a transition. And, and I read one of your posts on LinkedIn, where, where you were talking about that kind of search for clarity, and that sometimes mm. it's just not there. And, you know, again, life is a dance, you're referring to that right now. And I actually found it so helpful to kind of just let go of this kind of grand pursuit for clarity and just be present and be like, you know what, the right thing will come at the right time and just allow that yeah. to flow. Yeah. Absolutely. While on the subject of your LinkedIn, I have been following you for quite some time. You have some amazing <laughs> resources on the internet and awesome newsletter. Where can we find your work online? Yeah, you can just find me at davidspinks.com. I write a regular newsletter. That is what I spend most of my time on right now. I'm very proud of it. Um, teaches people community building and human connection. And uh, you can find all my other links from there. On uh, I post regularly on LinkedIn and Twitter as well. Um, and of course, you can grab the book, The, the Business book. of Belonging as well. Definitely grab the book.